Okay, good morning. Happy Monday. I hear a lot of yawning. I feel the same way. Um, anyway, uh, Friday we have a midterm. It'll cover chapters one through four. I may uh, complete four uh, sometime early on Wednesday. Uh, if I get into five, that's okay. You're only responsible for chapters one through four. And a reminder that you are responsible for emails that I have sent you. They're all archived on the web page. Uh, basically, I just want you to read them and pay a bit of attention. Uh, if I send you something, it's for a purpose. Usually it has relevance to what we're discussing in class at the time. But it brings in something from the markets uh, this week. In fact, I just sent you an email a couple minutes ago that I'll talk about in a minute. But it's, it's a short one, OK? Um, so uh, on Friday, we were introduced to uh, the exciting area of currency futures. And uh, we saw an interview with Mr. Jim Rogers. Uh, check out his website sometime. Um, he's written a couple great books about investing in foreign countries. And he's made a lot of money trading currencies. The currency markets are in the news today. That was the, uh, partly the email I sent you. Uh, basically, uh, our president is trying to convince uh, Japan and China to allow their currencies to become stronger, which means the US dollar becomes weaker. So the administration is trying to talk down the dollar right now, the US dollar. Um, so what I'd like to do today is give you a, an overview of uh, the, the different contracts that are traded on, as financial futures, what we call financial futures. And we've already discussed some of these, obviously. Um, but I put them into the, these three categories. We have the currencies that you're familiar with. Hopefully, some of you are trading them. On Friday, we learned about factors that influence uh, the exchange rate. It has to do with uh, government uh, policy. It has to do with economic growth. It has to do with interest rate differentials and so on. Um, and then there's a very large uh, market in what we call debt instruments, uh, or a lot of people simply refer to these as the treasuries. Um, T-bonds. We've discussed T-bonds. Uh, a large volume of trade in the European markets on bonds as well. And of course, the euro dollar, which is a short term interest rate. And uh, I'll explain the, the difference in the US treasuries in a minute. But uh, this market has been very, very active uh, for the last decade or so. Um, and it all revolves around interest rates. And we have different contracts depending what point we are on the yield curve. The yield curve shows you the interest rate against time to maturity. So we have interest rates for uh, 30 days, for 90 days, and for 30 years. And the contracts will pick different spots on that yield curve. And then, then of course, we have our equity instruments that we've discussed in class. Come in. Play some basketball? Um, and this, these equity instruments are, the, uh, for the most part, the uh, indexes based on stock markets. And we'll focus on what's going on in the US. Normally, I'll refer to the S&P or the NASDAQ index, which is uh, an instrument written on the underlying stock index. So if you look at the price of Dece the December NASDAQ futures, that's a forecast of what the NASDAQ will be in the month of December. Okay? Okay, let me talk a little bit about the financials. Um, as you know, futures markets have been around for many years, 150 years or so, but it's not true for the financial futures. Uh, these contracts were introduced in the 1970s, uh, which to you seems like a long time ago, but it doesn't to me. Um, 
And the first contracts were what's referred to as the Ginnie Mays, which stands for the Government National Mortgage Association. The U.S. government um, likes to encourage uh, construction of housing in the U.S. That's a big part of our economy, the housing market. And uh, partly to encourage growth in this industry, the government will guarantee home mortgages after they are repackaged. So if, as a homeowner, you go out and borrow money from a local bank or uh, savings and loan, uh, they lend you money to buy your house, they don't hold that mortgage for 30 years or 15 years, however long you're borrowing the money for. You're borrowing the money for 30 years, they're going to sell that mortgage. Okay? So they'll sell the mortgage, uh, these mortgages get bundled, they get packaged together and then sold as a package to investors, both domestic and overseas, and the government will guarantee the investment. So if you buy one of these packaged instruments and all these homeowners fail to uh, pay their mortgage payments, there's some economic disaster, the government will guarantee them, and this is the role of the, the Government National Mortgage Association. So these Ginny May contracts were uh, introduced, and basically they're long-term futures contracts. Since then, their importance has declined because of the rise of the treasuries, for the most part the treasury bonds. The next year, treasury bills were introduced. Uh, T-bills are uh, short-term instruments. They're very similar to the euro dollar, except it's the interest on deposits in U.S. Uh, banks that's reflected in the T-bill rate. The actual T-bill is a treasury. It's uh, an instrument that's sold by the federal government at uh, auctions. So uh, the government has weekly auctions where they will sell treasury bills to the investing public at a discount to their face value. And this is one way the government raises money. You know, the alternative is bonds. But on the short-term basis, the government will sell these treasury bills, and suppose it has a, a face value of a million dollars, it will auction them off, you buy it for less than its face value, you hold it until maturity, and then you redeem it for its face value, and the difference between what you paid and, and the face value is your effective interest. And most of these are auctioned 90 days before maturity. So there's a, a futures contract written on the T-bills, which reflects, as I say, very short-term interest rates, 90 days, sometimes 180 days. And then we have, of course, the T-bonds and the euro dollars that we're all familiar with. But just to give you some idea of uh, the rapid rise of these uh, contracts, you know, back when they started in the mid-1970s, of course, there was no volume in financials. The total volume on the Chicago Board of Trade was uh, 19 million contracts, and it was all either agricultural or metals. Um, then that rose very rapidly, and uh, last year I have statistics for it exceeded 200 million contracts in total. Of that, 160 million were financials, so a very rapid increase. This is just one exchange. The big uh, contract on the Board of Trade in the financials is uh, the Treasury bond, a T bond. Yes? No, annual. annual volume. Okay, so um, let's spend just a little bit of time on the portfolio of treasuries that are out there. Um, so first of all, the uh, federal government uh, raises money basically by issuing these treasuries. And for the most part, these treasuries are then retraded in cash markets or spot markets. And there's a very, very large market, secondary market in treasuries. Of course, if they're issuing 30-year bonds, that piece of paper is going to be around for a long time. That can be traded many, many times. Fact of the matter is, a couple years ago, the government started, stopped, I'm sorry, stopped issuing 30-year bonds uh, because we were in a budget surplus, you all know that that's changed. Now we're in a huge budget deficit at the federal level. 
so the 30-year treasuries may come back. Anyway, uh, there are three basic treasury instruments. There are the treasury bills that I just referred to. Those are sold at auctions. Um, and the futures contract that's written on a treasury bill is for a 90-day instrument. The bills always mature in less than one year. I said, you know, the auction might have a 180-day bill, but the contract that we're focusing on at the CME is written on a 90-day instrument, the same as uh, a euro dollar. The interest rate on the euro dollar is also 90 days or, or one quarter of a year, okay, a fourth of a year. So the bills, the notes are also sold by the U.S. Treasury. They mature between one and ten years. The ten-year T-note is sort of a standard reference. The ten-year Treasury note is a standard reference. And then, of course, the Treasury bonds that mature uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, they're not selling 30-year bonds right now, but there's still a lot of these older bonds in circulation that you can buy in secondary markets. Um, as I said, the T-bills are sold at a discount to the face value, and we'll talk about the pricing in a second. I explained how to price zero dollars. It works exactly the same for treasury bills. The price is discounted from the face value, and so if you look in the uh, Wall Street Journal, the futures price is 100 minus the interest rate or the yield, so if the interest rate is 3%, then the index, the T-bill index at the CME will be 100 minus 3, 97 will be the index. The, the notes are like the bonds in that uh, they're not sold at a, at a discount uh, from the face value. Uh, instead, they have a fixed payment schedule, a fixed coupon rate. It's either semi-annual or annual. And we talked about a bond with a, a 6% coupon. That's the standard that's uh, used for the futures contract at Chicago. It's a $100,000 bond with a 6% coupon, which means if you paid $100,000 for that bond and you put it in your safety deposit box, <laughs> then you would earn $6,000 a year for the next 30 years. Right? If you paid more than 100000 you still get paid 6000 a year, so your in interest would be the same in terms of the, the dollar amount, but the rate of return would be less because you're paying more than 100000 for it, <laughs> so the effective yield would be less, and therefore the price of the bond varies inversely with the yield, and we discussed that one day on the blackboard. And notes are the same way. Treasury notes are exactly the same way. And then you have... Um, there are a lot of other types of bonds around, uh, what's referred to as muni bonds, which are local governments that are issued. There are also some futures contracts that are written on uh, packages of these uh, muni bonds. Uh, usually they pay a slightly higher interest rate because there's a little bit more risk attached to buying uh, bonds uh, from a municipality because a municipality or a, or a county could go broke, right? Um, about 10 years ago, Orange County uh, ran into some major financial trouble. So those bonds will carry a higher interest rate. And then, of course, you have the euro dollars, which we've talked about, which again, I'll just repeat myself, the euro dollars refer to deposits of Euro U.S. dollars in foreign banks. Normally, we refer to them as uh, European banks, and you earn an interest on that money. It's, it's the old greenback. It's a U.S. dollar but you're earning an interest in a foreign bank that's not controlled by U.S. banking law, so the interest is always a little bit higher than what you could earn at home. And that's a very popular futures contract reflecting short-term interest rates. Yes, question back there. Um, is there a name for the discount for the uh, semi-annual interest rate? Is it just the bonds, you mean? The, the bonds, you mean? Uh, just a coup I refer to it as coupon, coupon rate. Yes. Uh, Treasury note. It's uh, all these uh, instruments are they're just a piece of paper. Nowadays, it's electronic, right? You don't even see it. It uh, just goes across on the computer. But basically, they're um, promissory notes that are sold by the government to raise money. You, can, you buy it, 
and it's and you hold it, it it doesn't have um, the maturity that a bond does. Treasury notes are typically five or ten years, and basically you're lending the government money, and you earn a rate of return that's uh, that's very uh, low risk, and that rate of return, as you know, will will vary with market conditions. Uh, because if you do, if you put your money in a, a bank in London, you're not protected by U.S. banking law. Okay, as an investor, so if you deposit your money with Bank of America, and you wake up tomorrow morning and you read in the paper the Bank of America has gone broke, um, you are protected under U.S. banking law. So your your deposit is protected. You'll get your money back. In other words, well, not for a foreigner. No, I mean you're on your own. Right. I'm not saying that England doesn't have those laws, but it, it wouldn't apply to you. Yes. The question is: Is the interest rate on euro dollar standardized or different from country to country? Um, in the spot market, it would differ, but uh, when we're referring to euro dollars, of course, we're always talking in the context of the futures contract. So that's a standardized rate. And it's uh, based on a, a rate in London called the LIBOR. It's a London interbank rate, overnight rate. So it's, it's based on the LIBOR index, so it is standardized. But you're right that uh, you know, if you put your money in a, in a bank in uh, Malaysia, or uh, you know, your US dollars in a bank in Malaysia, or a bank in Moscow, or a bank in London, you could probably fetch different interest rates, right? Um, you just have a record. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I don't buy bonds, uh, but um, as far as I know, if, if you insist, you could have a piece of paper. Okay? But essentially, you'll get a statement. Usually, you'll buy them through a brokerage firm. You can buy them directly from the government. Um, so you would get some sort of electronic record that you might keep electronically or print out. It's <coughs> just a piece of paper. Yes? Uh, well, the one question was referring to um, maybe unstable countries politically. So if you're investing in a very unstable, you know, I wouldn't put my money in the Bank of Afghanistan right now, for example. Uh, so I think there, you know, there it's, it's highly risky. But if you're depositing it in, in Europe, it's very stable. The, I mean, the LIBOR rate is, is uh, something that uh, you can count on. So. It, you know, I, I mentioned the differential in the interest rate. It's not huge. It's very small. But you know, if you're interested in a safe investment short term and you're going to park some money short term, that's a nice option is to put it in the euro dollar market because you'll earn a little bit more for your money. And you know, it's maybe not 100% safe, but it's 98, 99% safe. <laughs> but it, this is a... Um, it's a very complicated market, actually, because there are so many instruments floating around and so many different bonds with different maturities and different coupon rates. It's all very confusing, but it's a huge market <coughs> and um, one that's growing. It's uh, attracting a lot of uh, overseas interest. Let's see. I'll get to that in a second here. Um, But I think these are really good questions because it just illustrates how complex this market is. Uh, and of course, with the futures contract, we boil it down and we standardize it so there's just one instrument that's being traded. But um, most of these dead instruments have the characteristics that I've already touched upon in different ways. Uh, you know, they all have a face value, they all pay interest, they have a maturity, uh, the terms are very specific. Um, that's why you can easily write a futures contract on them. Um, I've mentioned the secondary market already. Uh, let me go to this slide, and then I'll just refer to this uh, article that I emailed you this morning. So um, why did this industry take off? You know, in the, since the late 70s, call it the early 80s, 
really in 20 years, why has this come to dominate the futures market? Well, there was a major shock uh, in the early 1980s when interest rates went to double digit. So basically the short term interest rate was 20%, 21%. Okay? Today it's 1% or 1.5. So it's hard to believe, but it's true. So interest rates went to double digit, uh, became very volatile in the early 1980s, and that was a very expensive lesson for a lot of financial firms. If you're in the banking industry and rates spike up to 20%, uh, that can be very costly. So a lot of banks actually, savings and loans went broke during that time period because they were left unhedged. Uh, as a result, a lot of the financial community now uses the futures market for hedging purposes because of interest rate volatility. It's, you know, we've discussed uh, the crude oil market, we've discussed the cattle market and other markets. This is no different. Uh, the interest rate is an important cost item for many firms, but clearly if, if you're a financial firm, the interest rate is the driving force with regard to your bottom line, and so there's a lot of exposure to interest rate volatility. We've seen a lot of volatility in the last few months on the long term of the yield curve, the long term bonds, and uh, this attracts a lot of attention from hedgers and speculators. Um, the point that I was anxious to mention was the fact that these are now global assets. Uh, we've talked about the U.S. bond market. Uh, when the government sells bonds, actually a large share of these bonds are purchased by foreign banks. Right now, if you look at the uh, Bank of Japan, and the Bank of China, they are two of the largest buyers of U.S. bonds. Also, the European banks hold a lot of U.S. bonds. Last time I checked the figures, something like uh, 30, 35 percent of the bonds were being purchased by either Japan, China, or some of the European banks, which is sort of interesting. It gives some people cause for concern, but it's simply a reflection of the fact that we are now in a global economy. China has a very uh, large trade surplus. They're exporting more products than they're importing. So they have a very large foreign exchange reserves, right? They're exporting products, earning U.S. dollars for those. That exceeds uh, the number of dollars they spend on imports. And so they have all these U.S. dollars. What are they doing with them? Well, they're sitting on a big pile of U.S. dollars, plus they're using this currency to buy bonds. So as they come into the market, they bid up the price of bonds. Uh, that drives down interest rates, which some people feel is good for the U.S. economy. You can take out a mortgage on a house. You get a 30-year mortgage for 6% or 7%, and you can thank the Bank of China, because if it wasn't for them coming in and buying up the bonds, you'd be paying 8%. Okay? Um, so that's good, uh, unless they change their mind, of course, and start reversing and start pulling out of the market. And uh, so if they go dead in the water and stop buying the bonds, okay, then, then the uh, price is going to fall uh, very rapidly and interest rates are going to rise. And there's a lot of concern in the market right now because our president is over in Asia. He's telling... Um, Japan and China, actually, that uh, their currencies are too low in value. They have to uh, increase the value of their currency. Uh, in the case of Japan, they're keeping the uh, yen down through open market transactions, basically through uh, moving money around in, in the global marketplace. Um, in the case of China, uh, they have a fixed exchange rate, so it would require a, a change in government policy to change the rate, but he believes that the fundamentals are such that uh, the, the, the exchange rate is too low. It needs to uh, increase in value, which uh, if that were to happen, 
would uh, strengthen their demand for imports from the U.S. And of course, then the U.S. dollar is going down in value, so it would weaken our demand for imports from Japan and China, and basically trying to correct this um, uh, trade deficit that we have with most of Asia. That's really where the administration is coming from. So they're putting pressure on these banks to uh, pull back, which means that they would decrease their purchase of, of bonds, the price would fall and long-term rates would go up. So it's, it's a bit of a uh, uh, knife edge because then if rates start going up, then people stop buying houses and the economy might start to slow down a little bit. Um, the email I sent you this morning was um, kind of interesting for a couple of reasons. One is just to illustrate how sensitive these markets are to, to, to news or statements by uh, government officials. Okay. Um, I give you an example in the book of, of where President Bush uh, gets mixed up between deflation and devaluation. He did it again recently. He started talking about uh, China's monetary policy. And, and today, nobody really knows if he really meant exchange rate policy or monetary policy, and they're trying to sort this out. Uh, with him, you're just never quite sure. But um, recently, he's been talking about he needs to talk to China about their monetary policy. But I think he meant exchange rate policy. Um, this story came out today. Our Treasury Secretary John Snow, who was in Asia a week or two ago, trying to talk the uh, Japanese and China into uh, inflating their currencies. He he was in Europe over the weekend, Mr. Snow, and. Uh, he made a, s a statement that surprised the markets. So the markets reacted to the statement on Friday and over the weekend. And he said something like, um, higher interest rates are an indicator of a strengthening economy. So he's talking about the U.S. here. Okay? And our rates, at least the short-term rates, are lower than they have been since the 1950s. So short-term rates are very low now. He says higher rates are an indication of a strengthening economy I'd be frustrated and concerned if there was not some upward movement in interest rates. So this is coming from our Treasury Secretary saying he'll be frustrated if rates don't go up. And of course the, the markets reacted. Um, there were a lot of sell orders going into the Treasury market uh, which sent interest rates higher. But now the White House is saying, well that's, that's just Jon Snow talking, that's not our policy. And, and he's just making this generic statement that uh, if an economy strengthens, rates will go up. So uh, whether he was or wasn't, the markets reacted to that, uh, but they're softening a bit today because they're not quite sure uh, if, if this is uh, government policy or not that we want our rates to go higher. So it's all part of this marketplace now being a global marketplace. Prices are highly sensitive, as I just explained with this article, right? It's a highly liquid market. Uh, the uh, videotape on Friday told you that the currency market was um, the largest market in the world. I think that's true in terms of value of trade per day. The currency market is the largest in the world, but uh, the U.S. Treasury market is not far behind. It's a highly liquid market, um, so it's very easy to buy and sell treasuries and there's a very short difference between the bid ask spread that's what a liquid market means okay anybody else see this story about mr snow okay um I want to spend some time explaining an important concept in these financial markets that has to do with something called the yield curve. Okay? Um, the yield curve is much talked about in the financial markets. If you go to the class website, I have some other links to sites that, let's say, focus on the bond market, for example. There's, there are two or three there that take you to sites that have a lot of information with regard to bonds. You might want to look at that this week and become a little bit familiar with the yield curve. Uh, Mr. Snow's remark um, 
was taken seriously by the marketplace because we're now sitting with a yield curve that we haven't seen for probably 10 years or so, um, and one that's very steep. The yield curve um, basically plots the yield, right, or the interest rate against time to maturity. I have a slide of it coming up, but I'll just show you. So you have, you know, very, very short-term <coughs> instruments, right? So you have uh, 90 days. You have one year. You have 10 year, and you have 30 year. So we look at these instruments and their maturities, or sorry, their yields, and we have our yield curve. The Wall Street Journal. Uh, every few days actually gives you a picture of what the yield curve looks like, and you can easily find it on the website too. So normally, the curve looks something like this. It's upward sloping, meaning that uh, instruments with longer maturities pay higher yields. They have higher interest rates. So I want to spend a little time explaining why the curve normally looks like this instead of this, although once in a while we see it downward sloping, but normally it's upward sloping, and there's an economic explanation for that. Um, and why are we interested in yield curves anyway? Why are they of interest? Well, obviously, they explain the linkage between the short-term rates on T-bills and long-term rates on bonds. But they also have a lot to do with market expectations. They have a lot to do with market expectations. And let me try to pull up some examples here for you. Um, well, I better, I better go over this slide. Uh, so as I said over there, they're normally upward sloping. So a 30-year bond will have a higher interest rate than a 10-year note. And the 10-year note will have a higher interest rate than a 180-day T-bill. Um, the yield curve is of great interest to financial traders given that it changes uh, its steepness as the market marches along. Once in a while it's inverted, going down, uh, but the curve is, is often changing its steepness. Um, and that is the long-term rates are changing vis-a-vis -vis the short-term rates. Uh, if you look at what's happened just in the last few months, uh, the short-term rate has remained unchanged. Okay. The short-term end of the yield curve, this rate here, down here, that is set by the Feds. Okay. So um, the U.S. Federal Reserve can influence the short-term interest rates. They have something called the Fed funds rate, which is an interest rate that banks charge one another for overnight deposits. And that's an instrument of government policy. They can change the Fed fund rate. And as I said, that rate is now the lowest it's been since the 1950s. So it's 1%. And it's been uh, dropped in a very straight line fashion since um, I think January of 2001 until October of 03, that rate has been pushed down and it's only at 1% now which is very very low. This end of the yield curve is not controlled by the government, it's really the market that controls this end of the yield curve really into even the mid to, to high end range. So that's why the yield curve is of interest, and that's what Snow is talking about. He said, I would be surprised if rates didn't increase as there's sign of a strengthening economy, which means that as the economy strengthens, he would expect to see this end of the yield curve increasing, so maybe it would become steeper. 
if the, the rate doesn't change at the short end, but it increases at the long end, and that's exactly what's been happening, okay? So here at uh, one year or less, and here we're at 10 years, and here we're at 30 years. A couple of months ago, um, the curve looks something like this. And what's happened since then, basically, is it's steepened. If you look at uh, December Treasury bonds, they were trading at 120 <coughs> basis points, 120 percent of par in June or July of this year, and they're now down to 107. So long-term rates have gone up in the last few months. If you know anybody that's renewing their mortgage, you know they missed the bottom of the market. Rates are, mortgage rates are higher now than what they were a couple months ago. For a typical house in the city of Davis, if you miss that market, the present value is significant. It could be $100,000 if you'd refinanced in July instead of now over the course of the loan. So um, the yield curve has steepened, and that's what Snow was talking about. And why do you suppose it's steepened? It's steepened because the market thinks that there's going to be economic recovery in the U.S. The market is telling us that the U.S. economy has some strength. So far, the Feds haven't budged. They've kept the uh, short-term rate low at 1%. The reason they dropped the rate so low was to stimulate the economy. Low interest rates are good for the economy. People will borrow money to buy a new boat or go on vacation or whatever they do. And this stimulates economic growth. And so that was the, the whole reason that the feds were pushing it down. So it seems to have worked. Now there, there are these indicators that we've been reading about that suggest there's economic growth, so the long end of the curve is, is coming up. And so what Snow is really referring to is that, that maybe, maybe it will flatten the game. So maybe we'll go to something like this. Right, so this was uh, July, this is October, and maybe by December or January, um, short-term rates will go up, which has to do with federal open market policy. That depends on the federal government. They might raise short-term rates. That's why the market's reacting, because he's hinting that um, rates should go higher across the board. Any questions on what's happening with the yield curve at the present time? So there's a, there's there is considerable information in this little relationship. Uh, we can really understand what the market is telling us if we watch the yield curve and how it behaves over time. The fact that it's steepened in the last few months is a very strong signal of economic recovery. It's steeper now than it's probably been in a decade. As the slide says, if short-term rates are really high, you know, so if the Fed got that short-term rate up to uh, double digits, uh, then we might have a negative slope. In 2000, the curve was negative. And that's also a signal when we see a negative or downward sloping yield curve here. That's a signal that uh, the rates are, are headed lower. The short-term rates are headed lower. And it's really an indication that there's a slowdown in the economy. And so for the economy to pick up again, rates will have to fall. So we, we have a steep slope now. As I said, it was 10 years ago um, since we, we've seen it this steep. So here's a, a couple of pictures for you um, to verify that it actually becomes negative. That was the curve three years ago, September 2000. Hard to believe, right? 
uh, the rate was 6.5%. Um, and now it's 1%. Uh, two years ago, they got it down to about 25 on the short, short end of the yield curve. Okay. A uh, huge difference in three years in terms of short-term interest rates. So you could imagine what that fall in the interest rate has done for economic activity. Uh, and interestingly, if you compare the yield curve in 2000 with 01, those long-term rates are very similar. Right? The, the curves cross out here. So the 30-year rate um, was very similar, about 5.5%. And this is, the, uh, this is what the curve looks like now. Your book has one from August, but last night I updated that um, from the Wall Street Journal. So this is what we're looking at. It's not much different than the one in your book. It's a little bit steeper, I think. Uh, basically, on the 30-year, we're just over 5%, so very similar to those earlier um, graphs. As I said in July, that 30-year rate was was uh, well below that. So the curve has steepened since then. The short-term rate was identical. It was at 1%. Okay. Any questions on the yield curve? Well, at least you sh should know how to draw one if I ask you that question or uh, ask you a little bit about its shape. Um, so I mentioned that, uh, that normally it's upward sloping. Well, why is that? Um, and there's, there is some debate about this, so I'm not going to pretend there isn't. But for the most part, uh, it's fair to say that it's normally upward sloping because of something called liquidity preference. Um, and that simply means that uh, everything else held constant um, if someone is lending money to the federal government, they have a slight preference for liquidity. So if they're going to lend money for 30 years, it's going to be tied up for 30 years. Right? You, you buy this bond, you hold it for 30 years. I mean, you could, you could resell it again, but its price is going to change. So if you're lending me money for 30 years, um, you're probably going to charge a higher interest rate than if you're lending me money for five years or even one year. And that just gets at the fact that everything else held constant, most investors have a preference for liquidity. In other words, um, if you're tying your money up in an investment for a very long time period, in all likelihood, you'll ask for a higher interest rate. So if I wanted to borrow money from you for 90 days, you might charge me 1%. If I said, well, I'd like to borrow that same amount of money for five years, You'd say, no, I'm not lending it to you for five years for 1% because there's a lot of uncertainty over the next five years. Rates could go higher. So if you want to borrow it for five years, you need to bid it up, get that price up. I might charge 3%. So that gives you an upward sloping yield curve. It's a preference for liquidity, which means that um, given the uncertainty in the marketplace, you just don't want to tie your money up for a long period of time. Um, we have different yield curves, of course, depending on what assets we're referring to. Uh, this just shows an example, of corporate bonds. So it's not only government that issu issues bonds, but also corporations, you know, General Motors, so on. Um, they'll also sell bonds. They, the yield curve looks the same. If you're lending General Motors money for 30 years, you want a higher rate than for 15 years, but you'll also um, so it'll be upward sloping, but it'll also lie above the Treasury slightly because there's more risk attached uh, to those bonds. Okay? So if we had a graph of the California bonds, according to Arnold, it's, we're almost junk. He was calling them junk bonds, but we're not quite there yet. But um, it would be much higher because it's a very risky investment now buying California bonds because the economy here is in trouble. Okay, that's the story on uh, the yield curve. 
and what's going on in the market recently. And I'd like you to pay a little bit of attention to that this week. Uh, maybe take a position in stock track as a result because it ties together many different factors here, especially given that our president's over in Asia right now talking about these very issues. Uh, we've got uh, international uh, differences in interest rates. We have international uh, uh, investment, a lot of investment from Asia into the U.S., into our money market. So that ties together policy on currencies, uh, the interest rate, and uh, also the stock market, the stock indices, because we're talking about economic growth here. Um, so if I guess if people thought Snow was right, maybe you'd buy uh, some of the uh, stock indices if, if he knows something you don't, and this economy is going to heat up and really start to cook in the next six months, then the stock market should continue to rise. What happens to the dollar? That's a very interesting one because um, you know, the administration is trying to talk the dollar down, but if in fact our economy does start to cook and improve, then maybe the dollar will maintain its strength, okay, and it won't weaken. So that one is a little harder to call. Yes. Inflation is very low now. So the question is, why would anybody buy bonds? Um, well, you'd be surprised. There are a lot of investors out there who are highly risk averse, and uh, they won't touch the stock market. Um, it's either keep your money under the mattress or buy bonds. Uh, so there, there are lots of investors who buy bonds. And right now, the uh, rate of inflation is I don't know what it is, 1% or less. And you know the yield on long-term bonds is still over 5 so. Well, as long as you hold it, right? If you, pay, if, you, if you pay par value, right now if you went out and bought bonds, you could earn around 5%. I think it's just a bit less than 5%. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Then, of course, that the price of that bond will change as <coughs> interest rates change, right? If rates go up, then the, the value of that bond is going to fall. So then your, your asset is worth less money. But, but there's also a lot of money that shifts between the bond market and the equity market. And you know, a year ago, there was a lot of a negative sentiment towards the stock market, right? Uh, we had our bubble burst, the stock market was down. I mean, a lot of people said, get out of stocks get into bonds and you saw the bond market rise rapidly last year right through till June and clearly that had something to do with money flowing into the market it had something to do with money from China and Japan and Europe flowing into the market push that price up and all of a sudden the price of bonds got up here and boom they turned and came down very quickly this summer so it's again it's a market where uh, you see a lot of volatility and some people buy bonds not to hold them for 30 years, but as an alternative to keeping their money in the stock market or under the mattress with the intention of moving it back out again in, in a year or so. Okay. I guess that's enough for today. I'll see you Wednesday.